morning. We're here with Dr. Isaac Wolf from Miami Neuroscience Center, and um, we're going to have a, a discussion with him about um, what he does. And uh, I think there's a lot of neat stuff that uh, people don't know that's available in this uh, community. And um, maybe we'll welcome Dr. Wolf. How are you? Good morning. Doing well, Jack. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let me, uh, still struggling with some of this uh, stuff. Let me exit some programs here. So um, I think the main thing people are, um, you know, wondering about is in this age of COVID, um, how do you, I mean, uh, if, I, if I had a brain tumor or if I had, you know, trigeminal neuralgia, which is the severe pain uh, in the face, um, I would come a little bit worried about, do I go see you? How do I know I'm not going to get COVID? Like, what, what are you doing to keep safe? Well, Jack, obviously, if you have a brain tumor or you have what people call suicide pain, trigeminal neuralgia, waiting till COVID goes away is a bad game to be playing, given the fact that we're having another recurrence and at higher frequency of people getting infected. So we never stopped treating patients throughout this process. We consider what we're doing essential work. And not only essential, but important to keeping the community as healthy as possible. We've managed to do it with our safety precautions, making sure that only the patient comes in to be evaluated and not with a group of, you know, 10 family members. Every patient has to go through, you know, a litany of questions about what they have been experiencing for the past two weeks, including symptoms that may be consistent with COVID prior to considering treating them. Many of these patients get evaluated through telehealth, which we've been doing since the early days of March, if necessary. I prefer to see the patient. All patients coming into our office get their temperature taken, obviously a history that's consistent with not being positive. And there are potentially patients that are, a, quote, asymptomatic, but are still COVID positive. We keep our distances from everybody. Everybody has to wear a face mask. Everybody wears gloves. Uh, and then get to the real issues. You know, how, how long can a patient with a brain tumor with trigeminal neuralgia wait? We haven't made anyone wait. We've treated consistently through March, April, May, and June patients that need treatment. Uh, we have not experienced a single case of a patient testing positive after being here. Patients that we are suspicious of, we do give them a COVID test 72 hours prior to especially if it's a child, because we do treat children and we need to intubate them because the intubation process is what we worry about. None of our uh, nurses and or you know, assistant physicians have tested positive through the process. So, so far we're in good shape. That's amazing. I mean, um... Because I, I was reading a story on on the effects of COVID, and they were saying that it, it's it's not just the the if you look at COVID itself, it's it's uh, basically you know the amount the percentage of people that dies maybe what two uh, percent three percent, but they were saying that more people die because they delay uh, care, and one of the things they delay care for is brain tumors, uh, which is uh, you have uh, the expertise, and so I I think it's. It's important for people to know that if you have any symptoms or if you have any issues, um, you should you should see somebody. And Dr. Wolf has been a pioneer on this. Uh, but uh, let's talk, Dr. Wolf, about how long have you been treating brain tumors? Um, what's your experience? Uh, I know it's been a couple um, of years, right? Unfortunately, too long. <laughs> so, so you know, when I went to University of Maryland as the chief of skull base surgery, that was in 1987. Uh, after my residency. And, you know, back then we were opening up everybody's head for any type of tumor, whether it was skull based tumors such as acoustic schwannomas or meningiomas or malignant tumors. And then when I left Maryland in 93 and started the Miami Neuroscience Center, we quickly ramped up the use of gamma knife radio surgery for cases where we didn't have to open up the brain at all. We could do this through. A, you know, a mechanism of radiating with a single dose so that patients were only affecting the tumor. Similarly, with trigeminal neuralgia, prior to that, you know, I, I was an expert on microvascular decompressions, which I 
I still do when necessary, opening up the head to decompress the nerve. But a tremendous number of our caseload for trigeminal neuralgia is managed by single dose radio surgery where the patient comes in the morning and goes home a couple hours later. Uh, so it's been, you know, almost 40 years that we've been doing this successfully. We've done over 12,000 cases with gamma knife radio surgery. We've opened up, you know, at least a thousand trigeminal nerves for microvascular decompressions. In COVID, we have still been, you know, doing microvascular decompressions uh, over the last three months when necessary. In the hospital, obviously, all patients get treated, get tested, I'm sorry, for COVID 72 hours and 24 hours before the procedure uh, in order to make sure that the anesthesiologist is safe. We have a COVID-free floor and especially a neurosurgical uh, suite so that none of the COVID patients anywhere in the hospital are close to this, nor are the nurses taking care of our post-operative patients. The good thing is all of them go home within 24 hours, even after a microvascular decompression, so that we feel we've done a very good and safe job. No, that's, 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 that's excellent. Uh, that's important I, I, you know, to point out that, it, let's say if you end up having surgery, uh, number one, the newer science center is totally separate in a separate building from the hospital. And that was like Wolf mentioned, everybody gets screened. Um, so it's a safe environment as far as COVID is concerned. And if you do need to be in the hospital for whatever reason, there's a whole wing, there's a whole floor that is completely COVID free. So that's, that, that's well, what the hospital is doing to ensure uh, your safety. But let me ask you a question, Dr. Wolf. Uh, uh, after treating 12,000 uh, uh, brain tumors, um, you know, we were used to listening to people say, I have a brain tumor, and we, we, we believe it's a death sentence. So that's the thing that's in the common, the common perception in the community is, if you have a brain tumor, you're probably going to die. Uh, and oh. I, I've seen your hope message, and, and I just wanted to convey to, to the people that, that recently get diagnosed and are told you have a brain tumor, and they're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, whether it's from metastatic breast cancer or just a benign breast, breast tum uh, um, brain tumor, how, I mean, let's talk about your outcomes, because I think it, that they're uh, amazing. It's essential to understand that, that all brain tumors aren't alike. And there are a variety of brain tumors that are actually very easy to treat and have, you know, better than 99% outcomes in terms of not having to do anything other than an outpatient procedure. And those are benign tumors like acoustic schwannomas, which in my opinion, almost never need to be opened up. And yet people in the community are still doing that. Meningiomas, which is a similar thing. And by definition in our hands, if the tumor, is, if the tumor volume is not creating a neurological problem, then they're completely treatable with gamma knife radio surgery with better than 98% excellent outcomes. You then have metastatic brain tumors. We have been the pioneers in treating multiple metastatic you know, metastases since 1993, where we broke the you know, academic rules, which were not scientifically based on how many metastatic brain tumors you can treat. But not only do we treat multiple metastatic brain tumors, but we have also made sure that we got rid of whole brain radiation, something in this community that is still a problem. There is still radiation oncologists in this community that mismanage a multitude of patients by giving them whole brain and essentially doing two things, destroying the person's healthy brain and ensuring that treating them after the fact becomes more difficult because once the patients have whole brain radiation, you have to be careful about what you're doing afterwards. When in fact, it's been clearly shown not only with our data, but with a tremendous amount of Japanese data now that you can treat over a hundred brain tumors that are metastatic to the brain. And it's simply a hundred times better than whole brain radiation for two weeks. A very important aspect of that that the patient never gets told is that whole brain radiation is not prophylactic. So if you still have an ongoing problem with the primary cancer, let's say breast cancer, breast cancer patients can survive many, many years, but still have active disease you know, in the primary area. That means they can still throw out brain tumors three, four, five years, you know, into the treatment plan. 
And if you've had whole brain radiation, that doesn't mean that the brain now is going to stop brain tumors from coming in. In fact, it doesn't matter that you've had whole brain radiation. You could easily get more brain meds. And so the whole reason not to do whole brain radiation is because you're just simply multiplying the risk to the patient. Now, the other aspect of what we do is we also treat primary brain tumors with radiosurgery. And despite the fact that you've got oncologists and radiation oncologists arguing, our results, our median survival for, for example, glioblastoma multiformity is reaching over two and a half years. We've got five, seven, 10 year survivors based on treating them multiple times when they get a recurrence or an outpouring of the tumor elsewhere than the primary site. So I think, you know, our experience has been tremendous and very, very useful for the community. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, so, you know, I, I've seen your patients uh, give their testimony of how they were, they were told they had six months to live. They had three months to live. They had metastatic breast cancer uh, to, the, to the brain, or they were told they, they should just get their affairs in order because they had months or weeks to live and how you brought back hope. And, and I think it's that, uh, you know, the, the fact that you, you're using all this vast experience, but, but how about the story of when you started using um, radio surgery and there was a big convention going on somewhere, it was in the 80s, and uh, they were saying how you shouldn't be treating all those multiple brain tumors at the same time, that you should do two or three. Uh, or, and, and there was somebody protesting outside, said, I, I had, the, how many tumors did he have treated by you? And, and was actually walking outside the place saying, and I'm still alive and I'm doing great. Yeah, originally, as you recall, Pittsburgh, which had the first gamma knife in the United States in 1987, made up a bunch of rules with no scientific basis that I could fathom. And when we got our gamma knife in Maryland in 91, I was still trying to figure out why, if you had two, two metastatic brain tumors, you could have gamma knife radio surgery, but suddenly if you had a third, you had to go to whole brain radiation. And so a patient came to us who had been, I think, poorly treated, in North Florida, presented with nine brain tumors and was told that he had to have whole brain radiation and that he was going to die within weeks. And when he came down to Miami to talk to us, I told him, look, these are the rules that have been set up by, you know, a prominent academic center. I think basically it's based on nothing but, you know, someone's dream of what needs to be done. You know, I told him we could easily treat it. It was just a lot of work for us at the time because the gamma knife was not automatically positioned at that time. Since then, it works, you know, beautifully in positioning for every single brain tumor. We had to do all of that manually. We treated him, and then he ran a marathon wearing a sign. My nine brain tumors were treated at the Miami Neuroscience Center. If you have any questions why I'm still going, please stop me while he was running. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because afterwards, you know, several individuals at University of Pittsburgh were telling people that I was insane. In the last three years, they've written scientific, quote, scientific papers, basically talking about treating 20, 25, 30 lesions all the time, never noting that we published in 1991 and in 1993 in cancer, because we couldn't publish in the journal of neurosurgery or neurosurgery because they would block it. But, you know, everybody in the world is doing what we started here in 1993 now. Everybody understands that it's a better way to treat it. This community, for some reason, continues to be reticent in competing hospitals and continues to feel that whole brain radiation is a tool that can still be used in my opinion, it is just plain malpractice. So, so I mean, j just so, so that everybody um, uh, knows, uh, by the way, uh, you're welcome to ask questions uh, right now on Facebook. Uh, just post your question and I'm monitoring the chat and I see a lot of, uh, a lot of great people are watching us. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for, for participating. Um, 
But if you have any questions, just go ahead and post it. And uh, even, uh, even later, we can always, uh, uh, um, you know, respond to it. Uh, you know, um, uh, President Carter was treated at a very prestigious center with whole brain radiation. It seems to be, uh, for some reason, um, you know, kind of the mainstay to treat people with whole brain. And I don't think the, maybe the public doesn't re know what whole brain is, but basically they're re irradiating your entire brain, including the cells that are normal. Um, with um, with radiation, obviously, uh, and what the, what the Dr. Wolf does is a, is a more of a precise approach as far as treating each tumor. Maybe explain a little bit what 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 is the gamma knife and how is it not treating the entire brain? How is it focusing on those specific lesions? Well, first of all, let me get back to President Carter. The fact is that President Carter actually did have radio surgery after the whole brain radiation, so he was lucky. Because in fact, for example, melanoma is resistant to the conventional ways of treating with radiation. Whole brain radiation uses multiple treatment dates. In other words, you have to treat for two weeks because the concept of whole brain radiation is that you have to catch the cells while they are dividing and tumor cells don't divide on a daily basis. There's each group of cells goes through their own cycles. Radio surgery relies on something different. It relies on focusing the radiation strictly on the tumor and use a much, much higher dose in a single setting. And we can do that by using real-time MRI scans with a frame to aim more precisely than the actual MRI scan itself so that we're able to treat lesions that are you know, less than one millimeter with 0 0.01 millimeter precision. Um, it's painless. And like I said, it's a single treatment. The other advantage for metastatic tumors with, with gamma knife radio surgery is that we can treat you many years after we've treated the others if you get new brain tumors and not affect normal brain. Whereas once you've been treated with whole brain radiation, you know the only thing you can use is radio surgery because more whole brain radiation will just absolutely destroy the brain if it wasn't done the first time. Almost 42% of patients after whole brain radiation, six months after the fact, are essentially dementing. And this is a process that is still being used in this community throughout you know, Dade and Broward County, unfortunately. That, that's just scary, isn't it? I mean, um... Uh, I, 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 and I just don't think there's enough awareness out there of how dangerous it is and what the long-term implications are. Uh, there's a saying in surgery that the, the best tool that a surgeon has is experience, right? You want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think, you know, some of the things is, are, you know, sometimes um, you want to go to the guy that's done the 12,000 cases for a reason, because that person has treated so many people that they know what can go right, what can go wrong, and they learn from that experience, uh, and it, it only goes to your benefit. Uh, but uh, okay. let's talk a little bit about that. How does experience uh, match with, with, I mean, the, some people do gamma knife radiation and offer it too, but the question is, uh, it, did, have they done 12,000 cases? I think that's, that's a good question to ask. Well, it's not only a good question to ask. I mean, it, what I tell people all the time is, look, if you, if you have a Rolls Royce, you don't take it to a Chevron station. You take it to a guy who is trained to you know, only treat the Rolls Royce and take care of it. Uh, there is nobody in the country anymore that has done as many cases as we have, not even the University of Pittsburgh. My physicist and I have been working together since 1993. We've done all of these cases together. And I think it's very important for people to understand that experience counts. It counts when you're flying an airplane in order to save lives in case you know something happens. And it, it counts in using a gamma knife for radio surgery. Anyone can pretend to do this once in a while, but you know, I believe that your brain is as important a organ in your body as everything else. And you don't want to go to amateurs to treat your brain. It's as simple as that. Um, we not only have been doing this for longer than anybody, you know, but we've also gotten, like you said, an experience that allows us to avoid complications. 
even as we're treating, you know, 50, 60 metastatic brain tumors, we know how to make sure that certain things don't happen. We know how to, you know, calculate doses that most people don't understand. We've had arguments with major cancer centers that say that you have to have a minimum of this dose to kill the tumor, when we know that we've killed the tumor with 50% of that dose in our experience. And so those are the things that people need to take into account when they choose someone to be treating their brain. I'm starting to see some messages here um, from some of your friends, Dr. Wolf. And uh, Dr. Wolf travels the world uh, giving conferences and teaching people how to do this. Uh, from Barranquilla, Colombia, Dr. Silvia Salva, remember her? Uh, yes, her husband. So she's saying hello. And uh, we have. Uh, uh, we actually treated many yeah. pediatric patients for her that came over from Cuba. Um, Correct. Very successfully. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Children with brain stem tumors that are still alive and doing well and still coming to visit us for follow-ups five, six, 12 years after the fact. So yes, those are good uh, memories. Yes, they, 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 of course. And, and we have some of those pictures on, on our website. There's Omar D'Angelo saying hello from Uruguay. Um, there's uh, Josvel Fuentes from Cuba. Uh, a lot of people remember you from, uh, from uh, all your travels and all your, your, your lectures and experience. Uh, Sean is asking, um, uh, what are new and cutting edge treatments on the horizon for brain strain glioma or astrocytomas? Okay, well, that's a really good question. What we need for treating primary brain tumors is obviously ways to turn off the genes, you know, in a molecular sense that propagate these tumors, not only where we find them, but to move forward. As of now, immunotherapy, even though it's been tried at multiple academic centers, hasn't really panned out to be the panacea that we are hoping. Uh, my belief is that right now the best combination for these tumors is actually a combination of drugs called Timidor and Avastin, which are basically drugs that stop the vascular proliferation of the tumor in conjunction with radiosurgery. But there are many, many promising studies that are focusing on changing the molecular you know, mechanisms by which these tumors propagate along the right matter tracks. Still a bit away from having these tumors being cured though. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's um, you know, very hopeful that, that at least, um, you know, you are in the hands of someone that has the experience and, and is willing to try new things, you know, and, and not just willing to do what everybody else does, kind of following the herd. I think that's a huge thing. Uh, Laura is asking, uh, what is the incidence of trigeminal neuralgia after gamma knife and what is the most common time frame? So uh, this, uh, the question goes like this. When you use gamma knife radio surgery with a single treatment, you have about an 87% success rate that the patient will be pain-free taking a single medication without side effects. Um, normally, the patient starts to feel better between three and four weeks after the treatment. We normally wait about 90 days before we decide whether it's a cure or whether we have to think about further treatment. The comparison basically is a microvascular decompression. When you do a microvascular decompression, if you find a vessel that is compressing the nerve, almost 97% of the patients will wake up pain-free. But the problem with trigeminal neuralgia is over time, and that can be anywhere from a year to 15, 20 years later, is that patients have recurrences. And so you have to have the options to do alternative therapies. In many cases, if it's a patient that's had gamma knife radio surgery and they get a recurrence, we offer them either a second treatment or a microvascular decompression. This versa, a patient who's had a microvascular decompression and five years later has a recurrence, we can offer them gamma knife radio surgery without any problems. That's great. And, and let's explain a little bit, because I mean, the, the people that have felt it obviously know what, what uh, trigeminal neuralgia is. Uh, but it's commonly called, as you initially mentioned, uh, suicide disease. Um, why, why is it called suicide disease? 
I mean, so the I, pain, everyone knows I get a pain in my face. Is that trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, no, no, describe no, no, no. What, what that is, because I look okay. very well. Trigeminal neuralgia is a clinical syndrome. You cannot diagnose it with radiological MRI scans, CT scans, x-rays. It is very, very, very clear, though, what it is. It's a very sharp electric pain that can occur anywhere in your face, meaning in your eye, radiating to your nose, radiating to your mouth, radiating to your chin. Anybody who has the pain describes it as a sudden shock, whether it's electric or knife-like, that takes their breath away. It can be initiated once you have this by eating, touching your face, brushing your teeth, but the pain is so intense that people say they just want to just go to sleep. Interestingly enough, in most patients with trigeminal neuralgia, once they go to sleep, the, the pain doesn't wake, wake them up in the middle of sleep. It only happens once they've woken up again. The mainstay of treatment for this is actually medical. Most patients will initially respond to anticonvulsants such as pegritol or what is commonly called carbamazepine or gabapentin, which people call neurontin. And for most patients, the medical treatment is actually really effective. It's the 10 to 15% of the patients that either fail after medical therapy or initially are unresponsive to medical therapy that need to be seen by us. Most dentists in this community have now been very well trained as I've given them a significant number of lectures. So most people now do not have unnecessary dental procedures anymore. Most dental and oral surgeons in this community are very wise to this, unlike in other communities, and really avoid unnecessary dental procedures. They, they do wind up being referred here almost immediately when it's recognized as trigeminal neuralgia. Yeah, that, that's actually uh, great because uh, we have an advanced education in general dentistry program. We graduate about 20 dentists every year and every two years and Dr. Wolf uh, always uh, lectures to them to make sure because a lot of these people, I guess, present to the dentist's office, right? Because they think it's a toothache. Uh, is that right? They, they come Correct. in. Yeah, they go, they go to a dentist, you know, they undergo tooth extractions or root canals, you know, procedures that ultimately do not change the course of their trigeminal neuralgia, but makes things harder to treat subsequently. And so like, like you said, we have been very lucky, the community is very lucky that we've been training, you know, a significant number of dental surgeons, oral surgeons who clearly understand that this is not in their camp and that they're better off either starting the patient on medical therapy or referring them here if that has failed. And let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, this technology of, of this precise radiation and, and uh, uh, I, uh, how did you come about it? Uh, how does it work? Uh, uh, my understanding is there's 182 or so beans of cobalt that go through and don't do any damage, and it's what they converge that they actually, so you can actually sculpt the lesion, right? Uh, well, could you talk okay. a little bit about how you came across that? Well, basically, um, Christopher Lindquist, who was a student of the inventor of this, Lars Luxell, uh, was working at Brown University in 1990, shortly after Pittsburgh got the only gamma knife in the United States in 87. And I happened to visit him at Brown University and we started talking about this technology. I happened to be the chief of skull based surgery at the University of Maryland. He said this could be a very useful tool. Uh, talked to my chairman and we decided we'd get the gamma knife at the University of Maryland. Back then, there was no computer attachment to the imaging. You literally had to take hundreds of x-rays of the tumor or the arterial venous malformation and manually put them into the program and, and basically take hours to do this. Uh, finally, in 1993, this became a computerized program. Your imaging went straight to your computer and you could do the, you know, the planning within minutes. The, the, the way this this works is basically you have a machine that has 192 beams, meaning that the target is getting targeted not by one 
shotgun, not by one rifle, but 192, you know, rifles. So that when it's going through skin and then skull and then normal brain, the radiation that's going through towards the target is far less than even a simple chest X-ray, way, way less. But by the time it accumulates at the center of the target, it's a very powerful force. And you can do this in order to shape around the tumor, let's say, you can shape it at, in any way possible that the tumor is presenting by adding shots to this, but still using 192 beams for each shot. Of those 192 beams, for every target shot, you can take away as many beams as you need so that by the time you're filling up your target, your boundary is getting the radiation you want, but outside of that boundary, the drop off of radiation is so low that it effectively doesn't produce a complication. And you can push this to the limits. You can treat tumors right next to the optic nerve, for example, using this technique. And we've been treating tumors that were supposedly too big such as pituitary tumors, by using this technique and making sure that we limit the radiation to the structures that are important to a tolerable level so that they don't effectively get complicated by too much radiation. By doing this, you can treat almost anything in the brain and not have a problem. Uh, Virginia is asking, um, it sounds like whole brain radiotherapy is palliative while gamma knife uh, radio surgery is actual treatment. Is that correct? Is, is palliative? Is that what she's saying? Whole yeah. Brain? yeah. Well, she's right. I mean, you never treat whole brain with the concept that you're going to cure the patient. And many patients with multiple metastatic brain tumors are thought to be, you know, in death's row. And my point is, is that that is not true. The majority of my patients, 96% of the patients that I have treated for metastatic brain tumors do not die of their metastatic brain tumors. So we have given the oncologist a weapon by which they can have time to treat the patient's primary disease with alternative chemo, immuno, or a combination of immuno and radiation therapies. It used to be that if you had four or five metastatic brain tumors, quote, you were dead in the water. And that's just not true. And that's why we believe that whole brain radiation is just an ineffective tool that is you know, hurting the patient instead of helping them. I wanna, I wanna put in a uh, little video you, you did. What if uh, you're on call? With, uh, uh, with uh, early on when we, when we started here at Larkin, um, just for people to watch while we get more questions. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember when, when you first came in, we, we did this video on, uh, on, 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 on that particular issue. Let me, uh, let me... Without... What if your oncologist said, without proper treatment, I only had two to three months to live. I was given three months to live. After a craniotomy and several rounds of chemo, nothing had worked. I would say there's still hope. My team and I at the Miami Neuroscience Center at Larkin have performed over 8,000 gamma knife procedures, making us one of the world's leaders in this life-saving treatment. Higher success rate, shorter recovery times, more hope. Choose the smart option. Choose the Larkin option. Call 1-855-524-2273. Remember that? That was the deja vu from uh, back when, right? Yeah, well... <laughs> How long was that? How long ago was that? A lot younger. It's over eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's the experience like? Let's say I, I, I want to go through um, gamma knife radio surgery. I'm a patient. Um, tell me what happens. Like, what? Uh, how long am I in the hospital for? Am I admitted for a week? Uh, what uh, do do you cut something so, to do it? So, how does it work? So it's really incredibly simple, and sometimes patients can't believe it, but. Basically, our patients start coming in at 5.30 in the morning. The first patient is going to have an IV uh, put in by 5.40. We sedate the patient so that the placement of the frame 
is painless, literally. Um, within five minutes, the frame is on. They go on to an MRI scan with the MRI scan images real time being scanned into our computer. We do the planning. Uh, an example, let's say if it's a trigeminal neuralgia patient, uh, that patient is in the gamma knife by 7.15 and home by nine o'clock. Um, the recovery time is essentially 30 to 45 minutes that we watch the patient you know, recover from the anesthetic that we give them. And almost every single patient is back to work the next day. There's absolutely no, quote, time in the hospital or time at home recovering from the procedure. So that it essentially is real outpatient surgery with immediate recovery to be able to function as normal as they are the next day. Excellent. Let me, uh, let me put a little video you did on this uh, back, back when, when we started. Uh, uh, will we describe the procedure? I had a, a pituitary brain tumor. I was told that I would live past three months. I have stage four breast cancer, which is spread to my brain, bones, lungs, and liver. They told me that I probably only had maybe 30 days left if I didn't do something. You know, when they first told me about doing this gamma knife, I really didn't know what it was. And I go, what is that? You're going to put surgery? That's exactly what I want to avoid. They explained to me what has nothing to do with surgery, a knife, or anything like that. It was basically a radiation that was going to attack direct the tumor. The gamma knife is a neurosurgical tool that allows us to do brain surgery without having to open up people's skulls. The procedure is actually quite simple. They will put like a big old metal piece on your head and keep you very tight and fixed so they can precisely hit the tumor without damaging anything around the tumor. The, the advantage of the frame is that we can be more precise and we don't have to worry about the patient's movements during the procedure. I remember the, the frame that they put on my head. That was like a halo. <laughs> when the patient goes into the gamma knife, they don't feel anything, they don't hear anything. It's essentially like being in a silent MRI scan. It's almost like magic. You don't even know anything's happening. I've never felt any pain. The neurosurgeon can use this tool to treat just about any kind of brain tumor and have the patient in in the morning and home by the afternoon. Like an hour after having the whole procedure done, I was uh, shopping at BJ's. You know, a, a month before, they're telling me I had 30 days to live, <laughs> which to me just seems beyond belief. There's something out there that can make the difference between life and death, and a lot of people don't know about it. The procedure helped me be cancer-free. Well, it's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, some of those testimonies, uh, I mean, just uh, are, are incredible. Um, we, we have a question from Carmen uh, West. She's asking... La salud es lo más oh, importante okay, en me, nuestra vida. Y I para gotta, los que padecen de alguna enfermedad, la esperanza y el... I gotta... Uh, uh, sorry. Technical difficulties. So Carmen West uh, is asking, uh, what would you recommend the course of treatment should be following both MVD uh, and Gamma Knife? My husband has both with no relief and has TN bilaterally. You know, that's a good question because it's a difficult question. There, there are peripheral procedures, uh, both a microvascular decompression and Gamma Knife radio surgery work where the trigeminal nerve enters the brain, what we call the dorsal root entry zone. There are peripheral procedures, what we call rhizotomies. And my associate, Dr. Jose Valeria, does one of those, what we call balloon compression. Sometimes the peripheral procedures work where the central procedures don't. If your husband has not had a rhizotomy, I would suggest that he try a balloon compression. Now, when you say your husband has bilateral trigeminal neuralgia, I have to tell you that that's only in 1% of the trigeminal neuralgia population. And so one of the important things to understand is, is to make sure that the diagnosis is correct. There is a difference between classic trigeminal neuralgia 
and atypical facial pain. And the big difference is the response rate to any treatment. Classic trigeminal neuralgia has a better than 85% success rate with just about anything you do, including medical therapy. Atypical facial pain almost never gets better than 60 to 65% success rate with anything you do. And so it is important to be sure that the diagnosis is correct. Excellent. We'll keep taking your questions. Laura Sudarsky is asking, what are the complications or side effects from gamonide? Well, that's also a good question. So important to understand, if you're treating gamonide free surgery for trigeminal neuralgia, that in less than 2% of the patients, there is the possibility of getting some subjective numbness. And what I mean by subjective numbness is not that your face is numb, because if you test it, you have more than adequate sensation to heat, to pinprick, to touch. It's just that less than 2% of the patients will experience a difference in the two sides, meaning they have slightly less sensation on the treated side than on the untreated side. When it comes to treating brain tumors, the potential for complications are things like what we call radiation necrosis, which means that there is an effect on the surface of the brain next to the tumor that you wouldn't have seen. But based on our dosing, we have had less than 1% complication rates for this. So what I would tell you is that the complication rate with gamma knife radio surgery is far less than the complication rate for anything else. For example, even in the best of hands, when you treat what we call acoustic schwannoma surgically, you have at least a 5% facial nerve paralysis. We have never experienced a facial nerve paralysis in thousands of gamma knife treatments for acoustic schwannomas. We do have the possibility of losing your hearing with gamma knife radio surgery if you, teeth, if, you teeth, if you treat an acoustic schwannoma that has hearing. But we also have a 67% hearing preservation rate, which is far superior to any open surgical procedure. Jack, I can't hear you. Uh, sorry, I, I muted myself. So that, that kind of speaks for the reason for the level of experience. So how, how many cases you've done, uh, gamma knife cases you've done, uh, or radio surgery, I say, because now there's, new, there's other technologies that we're planning to launch soon, uh, which we'll announce in a subsequent uh, um, uh, program, but, but uh, how many radio surgeries have you done? So we've done, we've done 12,000, over 12,000 now uh, at the Miami Neuroscience Center, all with the same team, all beginning in 1993. Um, and we are looking at other technology that we think ultimately, you know, pushed to their limits will probably be, you know, superior to what we're doing now but that will take us some time. Uh, we've done over a thousand microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia. So it's a fairly experienced team with very, very good outcomes. Let's talk about the, the pediatric cases. I mean, um, how many kids have you done? Uh, what, 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 and, and especially, you know, we, we, the kids we, that came from Cuba, uh, from uh, the Dr. Uh, Sylvia Saba, um, I see. I still see them posting pictures. I'm trying to find one of the pictures with you and one of the kids uh, who basically were told they would they would have uh, days or weeks to live. Then they they had their gamma knife procedure or the the radio surgery procedure with you and and uh, and uh, are coming to visit you regularly. How many of those kids are you following currently? Well, we we, we follow hundreds. I mean, we've treated hundreds of children under the age of, let's say, 15. Um, we also work with Miami Children, Miami, you know, Nicholas Hospital, Dr. John Ragev, the Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery, who comes over here and treats patients as well. Um, I have to tell you that, you know, most of the time, the kids that come here are desperate cases because they've basically gone through all the conventional, you know, known treatment plans and they have failed. Patients with medulloblastomas, 
ependymomas that are, you know, metastatic, you know, primary pilocytic astrocytomas that have failed multiple surgical attempts. And we are very happy with our results. We have, you know, most of the referring neurosurgeons are happy that their patients have, you know, started to get better and are living, you know, much longer lives. Uh, these are very difficult patients to treat because they've undergone so many other modalities, and yet we have been surprised by some of the outcomes, you know, that have been fantastic. Excellent. I, I just found another another uh, video I'd like to show uh, that you did early on. It had worked. I would say there's still hope. Okay, My team and I. From the, let me start from the beginning here. Without proper treatment, I only had two to three months to live. I was given three months to live. After a craniotomy and several rounds of chemo, mm. nothing had worked. I would say there's still hope. My team and I at the Miami Neuroscience Center at Larkin have performed over 8,000 gamma knife procedures, making us one of the world's leaders in this life-saving treatment. Higher success rate, shorter recovery times, more hope. And this, uh, in that picture, we see Sam Coy. Uh, tell us who Sam is. So Sam's my physicist who does the uh, treatment planning based on what I tell him we need to treat. Um, Sam is essentially probably, you know, one of two or three of the most experienced physicists in the, in the world uh, planning gamma knife radio surgery and one of the pioneers for uh, Gamma Plan, which is the, the treatment platform that all gamma knife users use to uh, plan the treatment options. How long have you been working with Sam? Uh, we've been working together since October of 1993, nonstop. Yeah, that's uh, Sam might be getting sick of me by now. I, he, uh, I mean, I mean, he's, uh, it, it's amazing that, that, that length of time. I think most of the people that have been working with you have been working for the same time frame. H how important, I mean, there was a study recently um, and, and, and the major medical centers looking at uh, what the team meant. Like you could have people that are very skilled uh, doing procedures, but that every component, every member of that team was important. And, and that the fact that they could work together was important because what's causing complications usually, especially with these high risk procedures where somebody's actually operating on your brain, <laughs> is the fact that the communication uh, or, or, or even the personalities of the surgeon don't match with this personality of the rest of the team. And the, the cohesiveness of the team uh, can really um, guide the outcomes. Well, uh, I, I look at this as what, you know, the aviation industry created, which is a, a safety check that is vital to making sure that planes don't just fall out of the sky. And one of the important things about having a team that has worked together for this length of time is very simply the respect that you have for one another. I feel that it is very important for people to be able to tell me that I am making a mistake. And it's very important that the person who's telling me that is someone that I respect enough to know that I better question what it is that I'm about to do. And Many times that goes on between Sam and I on a daily basis. It is vital to be able to understand that you can never be 100% right. And many surgeons live their lives feeling that they're 100% right, but they also have a very difficult time facing and recognizing complications. The way to avoid complications is the same way that, you know, the aviation industry has found they can avoid crashes. And that is by having a checklist system that basically makes you check every step along the way that everything you just did is correct. And having a team that has worked together for, you know, almost 30 years is just such a checklist. Everyone knows that they can tell the other person that they're wrong without being told, well, you're not the boss. Everybody works like the boss. The only boss is the patient. 
we have to be 100% sure that the patient is getting the best treatment possible and the safest treatment possible. And we manage that by having a team where everybody respects each other and everyone knows that the way to avoid mistakes is to keep questioning that other person as to what you know their real goal is in that treatment and in that you know particular pathology. That's uh, I mean that that's huge. Um, let's talk. I mean, we, we only have, believe it or not, it's only ten minutes left. But uh, it, it's uh, I think we could talk for hours about this. Uh, the other thing that you do uh, very successfully is also neck um, uh, surgery, uh, cervical spine uh, surgery. Let's talk a little bit about that, about for what, what procedures you use, what your outcomes have been, how long you've been doing it. Well, you know, when I was at the University of Maryland, we, I also ran shock trauma. And there, we used to get a significant amount of cervical trauma, you know, spinal cord injuries. In early 1987, we started to use the, the first anterior cervical plates created by a German guy and early on recognized that we could get our trauma patients immediately stabilized within hours. And even if they didn't reverse their neurological deficits, we can get them to rehab within days after that initial surgery. Once I started using the cervical plates for elective surgery, you know, I helped many companies develop uh, systems by which it is much easier to rehab from simple cervical discs without having to just wear collars for three months, hard collars, et cetera. So ever since then, you know, almost all of our, you know, degenerative cervical spines, what people call cervical spondylosis or acute herniated discs have been treated with progressively better and better and simpler systems of stabilizing the spine immediately intraoperatively and letting the patient, you know, get back to working out within a week after the surgery so that they're not, you know, rehabbing three months after the fact. Um, all of our cervical surgeries are very straightforward for patients. You know, most, most 100% of the patients go home the next day. Um, you know, within a week, they're starting to work out because their spine is stabilized. And most people are very happy with their results, engaged in a manner by which they can immediately start physical therapy if it's necessary and or their normal routine of workouts. How does somebody know, let's talk about symptoms now. So how does somebody know, um, we'll start with, with, uh, with the spine since that's the last thing you talked about. How do I know if I have neck pain? How do I know when I need to see a doctor? Well, I would say that most patients with neck pain will get better on their own. They take an anti-inflammatory and muscle relaxant. For the most part, most cervical pathology should be treated conservatively. Um, the, you need to see a doctor essentially for two reasons. One is if you start to note specific weakness in a specific area of your arm that is getting worse. That is not something you, you should wait for. Or two, when the pain has gone treated for a significant period of time, you know, quote, you know, without, uh, you know, medical therapy other than anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxants, or we call conservative therapy, let's say physical therapy is also put in there. And yet the pain is interfering with my normal life. In other words, I'm a you know guy that likes to go play golf. And ever since I got this neck pain and arm pain, I've been unable to play golf. And every time I take something, it gets better. But then when I try to play again, I can't play. That's a subjective, you know, interference of your normal lifestyle that should call upon you to go see a doctor, preferably me in my mind, a neurosurgeon, so that the appropriate, you know, tests can be ordered, such as an MRI scan of the cervical spine to assess what is really causing the pain and can further conservative therapy improve it or are you at a point where surgery is needed? Okay, so now moving on to, to brain tumors. I, actually, I have one question is, uh, I use my cell phone a lot. I put my cell phone in my uh, uh, 
head sometimes. It, the, does that cause cancer? We, we, we hear a lot of that. No, the, the, the higher incidence of, of, of quote, brain tumors is really predicated on the fact that we have such tremendous imaging tools and the fact that so many people with a simple headache get MRI scans. So the, 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 in the past, when I started medical school, you had no CT scans, you had no MRI scans. Most people who came to the emergency room with brain tumors were thought to have had stroke. Nowadays, we can easily distinguish between a stroke and a brain tumor. So imaging quality and, and, the, and, and the amount of imaging available to the population in the United States is really the only reason we're finding more brain tumors. It is not based on things like cell phone usage or even probably things that you eat. Some environmental factors may be causing brain tumors, but it's a very fuzzy, you know, sort of correlation. And how do I know I have a brain tumor? I have a headache uh, for a day or two. Uh, it's an unusual headache. How do I know that I need to get an MRI? Well, I would say several things. Um, a headache that doesn't go away and you've never experienced such a phenomena before. A headache that keeps getting worse. A headache that's associated with neurological symptoms such as you know visual disturbances, weakness of one side of the body. Um, um, some brain tumors, such as acoustic trinomas, present with a sudden, you know, slow deteriorating loss of hearing. You have to worry about acoustic trinoma then. Um, numbness and tingling in one side of the body that just doesn't go away. I mean, all of us get tingling. You know, at times we sit in a movie theater, we cross our legs, we get up, we can't, you know, we can't move because there's so much numbness. But persistent numbness in one side of the body that isn't going away, that it may be getting worse. These are things that you have to think about that can, you know, be the, you know, basis of a brain tumor. A sudden seizure, a patient who never had a seizure before and suddenly has an epileptic fit or a seizure, that patient obviously needs a neurodiagnostic test like an MRI scan because you have to rule out a brain tumor in a middle-aged person who has a new onset of seizures. So all those things factor in. But, you know, it's so easy in our society to achieve that and rule out a brain tumor that, you know, in a way, that's one of the advantages of our healthcare system. Excellent. Well, I want to say that uh, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Wolf, for participating today and uh, everybody that was on the uh, asking us questions. We're going to obviously have this on, on, on Facebook, but we're going to put the number for to make an appointment. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, Dr. Wolf's available both for in-person and uh, telephonic or video consultation, tele telehealth. Uh, he's never stopped throughout the pandemic. So please don't put off your uh, treatment if you have any symptoms that, uh, that were described today. I want to thank you, Dr. Wolf. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack, and thank the public. Have a good day.